Hello everyone and welcome to Boosting Student Attainment and Engagement Through a Strong Green Technology Agenda, a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with Workspace IT. My name is Julia Gilmore, I'm the Branded Content Manager for EMEA and the Americas at Times Higher Education and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Please note that a recording of today's webinar will be available on demand along with a summary article on the Times Higher Education website in due course, should you wish to revisit this discussion or share it on social media or with colleagues. I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel of experts. We have Danny Clark, Principal SE FSNI at Citrix, Dan Ogilvie, Technical Consultant at Workspace IT, Kat Piotrowski, Partner Technical Strategist at Citrix, and Ben Ward, Field Technologist, Principal SE at IGEL. Those of you in the audience today will be able to put questions to the panel using the Q&A box. We'll have two opportunities to answer your questions during the session, so if you don't get your question asked the first time, we'll get around to you the second time. University sustainability credentials are, increasingly an, are an increasingly important metric used by students when deciding which institution to attend with existing students continuously challenging their universities to go even greener. One major area of focus of the green agenda is IT. Universities can not only boost their sustainability credentials, but also save significant costs and time by repurposing hardware rather than replacing it, as we'll find out all about today. I'm now gonna hand over to Dan Ogilvie, who's going to kick off our discussion. So over to you, Dan. Thank you, Julia. Hello, I'm Dan Ogilvy from Workspace IT. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Workspace IT later on, but today I just want to give you a brief run through of what we're going to be talking about. So the main topic is sustainability, which is a very broad area. I'll let Ben deal with the hashtag in a little while. I know he's desperate to do that. But what we're going to do is just talk about sustainability and how it affects IT, particularly in higher education, how it affects student priorities, how they pick universities based on green credentials, all the areas that IT can impact, such as power, travel, and device, reducing you know, the impact of all of those things, and how IT can help with potential solutions in those areas. There's not always, you know, putting in just a green solution for the sake of it isn't always the answer. There has to be other benefits as well. So we want to put in and talk about solutions that help with your green credentials, and also I've got real benefits for students and the rest of the faculties. So with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, ben from Ben Ward from IGEL, who's going to start our discussion today. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. So I suppose one of the key questions has got to be who actually cares about the planet? Um, and I know when I was growing up, so I'm not going to tell you my age now, OK, but I know when I was growing up in school, we were always talking about acid rain and the ozone layer. And I know other generations, other people I've spoken to have had different stories from when they were growing up about what they were talking about when it came to sustainability. So all through the different sort of generations, the different groups and cohorts of people, we see um, people interested in, in different things, in, in different aspects of sustainability. Now, one of the things that I did in my research was to try to work out if we can break down who actually is interested in sustainability um, in the climate emergency based on their social media usage. So the first one that I looked at was TikTok. Now, TikTok is pretty famous for being used by um, a lot of younger people, a younger demographic. Now, when I checked out the sustainability hashtag in May last year, it had roughly 1.7 billion views. And then I checked it again in October and it had 2.7 billion views on the sustainability hashtag. I've checked again this morning and it's now 3.2 billion views. That is a huge number of views on the sustainability hashtag and all the other sustainable hashtags and green hashtags that go, that go under that. So one of the things we can say when we're asking the question, who cares about the planet? We can definitely say there's a younger cohort of people, the sort of people who will be deciding on the universities or might be in higher education right now. This is a huge group of people who are actually very much engaged in what's happening with climate change. And then I had a look at something that's a little bit more my speed. I had a look at Twitter and the sustainability hashtag on Twitter. And that was having 692,000 views per hour. And I don't know about you, but if I had an organization that had that many views on my page or um, on my Twitter handle per hour, I would be very excited because I'd be very successful. This is a, a stat that is growing all the time. And then we've got Google. So when you um, search for the, the search term sustainability, over the past five years, there's been a 1,650% growth on that search term. So if we're going to answer the question, who cares about the planet? Well, realistically, 
everybody these days with a huge focus on younger generations who are coming into the workforce and coming into higher education. And there's a really good reason why these people are getting engaged with this whole idea around sustainability. And that's because of all the news articles we've seen probably over the past 12 months. Now, ever since um, COP26, we've seen a massive growth in interest in sustainability in the climate emergency and a lot of this has been driven by the news articles that we've been seeing all over the place and I'm pretty sure all of you would have come across at least some of this or even experienced some of this so one of the news articles I've got here Pakistan floods one third of the country underwater just last month or even a few weeks ago we saw huge parts of the US hit with ice and snowstorms unprecedented levels of freezing cold weather across the US in China they had heat waves in the south and they had floods in the north. Even in our own country, uh, I mean, I'm based in Leeds, we had 40 degree heat, which is completely unprecedented. Usually in the, in the north of England, we'd expect grey, drizzly weather pretty much 99% of the time. The, the weather was so hot that it was just absolutely awful. But we're seeing this more and more. And this is driving a lot of engagement and a really boosting the profile across all these demographics when it comes to climate change. And I think, Kat, you've got a little bit more information when it comes to students and their thoughts on this. Yeah, no, definitely. Obviously, we can see the stats on the screen here. And I wanted to relate it a little bit more to, I suppose, what students are feeling nowadays. And uh, to give context, I've been working uh, with uh, Citrix's public sector customers for the last two and a half years. Um, and two of the account managers that I was working with on a day to day basis, going around and speaking to other universities and, and higher education, um, they had two uh, children themselves that were looking for universities themselves. So they backed these up with a lot of stats because I was genuinely surprised, particularly by the 91 and the 80 percent here that you'll see. Because when I think back when I started university, it was how nice are the halls? You know, what are the student nights out like? What, what sort of facilities are going to be available to me? The first things that they were asking, and obviously they asked their children candidly as well, and they wanted to know what are the universities that they're applying for doing from a sustainability standpoint? How are they going to make what they're doing more sustainable, but taking it down more on a level of not just what laptop or, or PC are they gonna to offer to me? How are they actually going to make what they're doing help a green agenda overall? And I actually, I, I suppose I'm not surprised by that, but I was more intrigued to how that was going to move further forward. Obviously, we can see some of the facts on the screen here, and I think we go into those in a little bit more data, but it was just the fact that we're hearing it from people relative to us as well of going, this is actually a big change that people are asking for. It's not just, you know, how many <laughs> windows am my dorm going to have? What is it going to be like in terms of a student night out? It is going to be, I want to be part of a university or an organisation that is going to be helping our planet moving forward. Okay. So just uh, so Danny from Citrix and um, one of the things I mean my, Pat, uh, my colleague is very much more in the trenches in terms of our, our education customers but for me I work primarily with our financial services insurance customers but very closely with the guys there that, that are concerned about this stuff and we've done an awful lot of research clearly you know sustainability is a, is a huge topic as, as Ben mentioned but um, we know that IT uses 10% of all business electricity which yeah, it's just very simple but commuting I appreciate that commuting and traveling to university are two slightly different topics, but commuting represents 27% of all metro miles traveled for our, our customers across the board generally. So these are huge considerations when it comes to sustainability calculations and, and, and changes that can be made. So um, what that means in terms of the impact that's having electricity, 2.3% of global emissions from IT alone, Commuting, 2.8% of emissions from commuting, 2.7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide annually combined just from those two factors, which is something that we can hopefully um, do something about and help IT make a contribution to our, uh, our customers' uh, efforts. We calculate that 3.2 billion acres of forest will be required to counter that level of um, environmental impact just from, from from travel and IT electricity alone. So, I mean, that's clearly, that's unsustainable. There's no way that that can be achieved um, just for 10% uh, of the electricity. What we can do, though, is we know that 50% of that impact is from inefficiencies. And these are areas that we can address with the appropriate um, uh, technologies and approaches and strategies. So inefficient devices, we'll go into that a lot 
later. Ben's going to talk uh, extensively about that. But inefficient data centers and inefficient use of computing. So physical data centers, on-prem data centers that our customers use are nowhere near as efficient as those that are provisioned by the global hyperscalers, the likes of Microsoft and Google and, and, and Amazon. So there's way, things we can do to move workloads to more efficient um, points of execution, but still deliver excellent, secure, high performance, engaging uh, user experiences. And also by decoupling the point of execution, point of consumption of applications, which is what, what we're going to talk about later, can seriously reduce the amount of travel required to gain access to resources and tools and, and workloads. Now, this is a, a pretty scary stat. And if you want to have access to some of the research we did behind us, we can absolutely let you have it. My contention here is that for probably 30 or 40 years, the technology industry has been putting a little bit of a sleight of hand when it comes to talking about sustainability. If you think about the, the, the bright orange Energy Star logo that you might have seen on a lot of PCs going back maybe 20 years or so, whenever you saw that, maybe you had a sort of a warm feeling that you were doing something good for the environment. You were, were reducing power consumption. But the one thing that we haven't focused on in technology, especially in, in, in sort of my experience, is the manufacturing of devices in the first place. And this stat bears calling out. So up to 83% of the device's total carbon footprint is generated during manufacturing. So what that means is once a student or once a faculty member gets a, a laptop, let's say, or a PC delivered to, to their desk, by the time that that machine has actually ended up in front of them, the vast majority of its total greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions have already been accrued. So that means if you're looking at any of those policies you may have looked at in the past, such as uh, reducing power consumption by turning the device off or turning down screen brightness, or maybe putting on a power efficient screensaver, the best that you can ever hope to do when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions is maybe to reduce up to 17% of its total life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. 83%, the vast majority of that device's total climate impact has already been accrued before it hits the user's desk. That's a shocking stat, and it's one that hasn't been talked about enough. It's one we haven't been told about. Now, one of the reasons, well, several of the reasons why manufacturing is so intensive is because of the raw materials that go into making a device. Now, I had a look into some of these raw materials, and you can see a list of them uh, on the screen right now. So some of these, I, I'll be honest, I've never heard of before. But then we've got more, more sort of common mineral, minerals like cobalt. We've got tin, um, ferrite, ruthenium was a new one for me. But all of these, and there's rare earth, there's more common minerals, etc., that go into making that, that, let's say it's a shiny new uh, MacBook with all the aluminium and glass. There's a whole load of different raw materials that go into making that device. But the interesting thing about all these raw materials is you can't just open a single mine and get access to all of these raw materials. All of these different parts of a device need to be mined from mines all over the world. And that's where... Um, investigating supply chains, investigating where all these different um, minerals come from is really important. So what I've done here, and you might see it's sort of a, a Japan-focused map, it's, there's a reason for that, don't worry about it. What we have here is um, a plot of where all these different raw materials come from. Now you can see that big red dot right in the middle on the east coast of China, and that's because the vast majority of laptops are actually manufactured on the east coast of China. Um, so whether or not it's HP or whether it's Dell, most of the manufacturing or at least final assembly is done there. If you think about the, the Apple tagline, which says something like designed in California, assembled in China, that's missing out a lot of the steps that go into actually putting that device together. So if we now plot out all of the different raw materials that we saw in that last list, this is what it looks like. So you have um, gallium coming from Poland. You have uh, tin coming from Indonesia. You have copper from South America. You have ferrite and ruthenium from Siberia. Now, we could quite easily put another layer on here that talks about conflict minerals. That's a whole different discussion. But when it comes to supply chains, we need to have a think about all these different um, all these different areas that we could potentially think about. So this is where all the raw material comes from. All of that raw material then needs to be shipped to the east coast of China to be made into components. And it gets a bit more complicated than that as well, because not all of the components will actually be manufactured on the east coast of China. You think about semiconductors. A lot of them will actually be manufactured in Taiwan before being sent to the east coast of China to then be assembled into that final laptop or PC or thin client or mobile phone potentially. 
And that's not the end of the process either, because once those devices have been created, they then have to be shipped to distribution points right around the world. Um, and then from those distribution points, then to the end customer or to the end user. That is one of the reasons why um, devices are so intensive when it comes to manufacturing. That is one of the reasons why all of those greenhouse gas emissions, all of that CO2, all of the carbon footprint is actually accrued during manufacturing. So the power utilization piece, the bit that we've, we've always thought about in IT is actually a much smaller proportion of a uh, device's total greenhouse gas emissions. And that's just the, the manufacturing and then the life cycle piece. There's the other end of this as well. And I know that's got more visibility and it's good that that's got more visibility, but I think we need to focus on this as well because, I mean, here's, here's a great stat and I know it can be quite difficult to sort of frame this, but in 2021, the world generated an estimated 57 million tonnes of e-waste. And by the way, the UK um, is a big cause of some of these problems. There's a, um, this is a shameless plug here for, for Netflix, but there's a great documentary on Netflix called eLife. And that talks about what happens to a lot of these different, um, a lot of this e-waste. So uh, it focuses more on sort of computing e-waste. But from the UK, a lot of this stuff gets shipped to places like Ghana. So developing economies. Um, and when they're there, they're actually um, not recycled properly. And this is something we'll, we'll cover very, very soon. But if we wanted to articulate what 57 million tons of e-waste looks like, well, I've done that for you here. There are actually 350 cruise ships on this slide. Feel free to count them. Um, but if you were to, to put 57 million tons of e-waste in context, it is roughly 350 cruise ships. Now, if you lined them up end to end, it would it was a roughly 77 miles worth of cruise ships. And if you walk at the speed that I walk, that's probably about two days worth of walking just past all these cruise ships. That's how much stuff, and this, this isn't just um, IT waste, this isn't just computing waste, this could be fridges and microwaves. That's how much stuff we throw away every year, and that's increasing. The year before it was about 51 million tons. This isn't a problem that's getting better. But as I said earlier, a lot of this stuff is not recycled properly. In fact, there's a stat that only 17%, there's that 17% again, only 17% of the electronic waste that we throw away is actually recycled properly. And as I said, some of it ends up in places where it really shouldn't be. Not recycled, just dumped in areas where potentially you'll have vulnerable people, you'll have children who go up to this raw material and sometimes they will set fire to these old devices to release some of the raw components. They can make some money off the raw materials in these devices. And you can imagine, I mean, there's a WHO, a World Health Organization quote here, but you can imagine how damaging that could potentially be. If you think about all of the components, all of the gases, all of the, the toxic elements in these devices, if we're not recycling them properly, then in all likelihood, someone else is trying to do it in a way which really isn't conducive to health and safety. Okay, so, that brings us to sort of the first um, Q&A session. So over to you, Julia. Thank you so much. Um, I actually have a question to kind of kick off the Q&A, if that's all right. Um, so this might be a good one for Kat, actually, um, based on conversations you've been having with university partners. So considering how important sustainability is to the next generation of students, like we, we all saw the stats, do you believe that the focus on sustainability at universities can actually help enhance student recruitment? 100%. Actually, you're, you're jumping ahead a little bit, and it's, it's a good question as well, because it is something we are going to cover in a couple of the slides we go through a little bit later. But my simple answer, yes. Um, I suppose the next part will be it's, it's how you adopt those policies. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the case of, oh, we're going to you know, change all the cups that we use or we'll change all of this particular element. It's about ingraining it in a large proportion of the way that the universities or higher education as a whole operate. But yeah, we'll, we'll go into that. Awesome. Thank you. And this might be a good one for you, Ben, actually. How important is the supply chain as a whole when considering the sustainability of universities? It's incredibly important. Um, and in fact, there are a whole load of um, different scopes, which whenever we're talking about sustainability, generally we're talking about three or actually now four scopes to be able to capture and, and report on the greenhouse gas emissions that each institution is responsible for. When we're talking about supply chain, realistically, we're talking about scope three. We're talking about upstream, we're talking about downstream, depending on whether you're the manufacturer or the end user. It's incredibly important to be able to factor all of this in though. And in fact, to be, 
um, sustainable. You need to be able to, to, to report on scope three emissions, and that includes your supply chain. But I think there's another piece to that as well, which goes a little bit further. And I sort of called it out a little bit when I was talking. When it comes to the supply chain, there are so many other factors in there as well that we don't tend to think about outside of just greenhouse gas emissions. There is conflict minerals, there is modern slavery. Um, if you think about Apple's supply chain, Foxconn got called out on their modern slavery uh, probably about two, two or three years ago. So when we get these new devices, and when we have these sort of shiny devices, and I think we've got a bit of an, a, an addiction to new and shiny uh, when it comes to technology. When we get these new devices, we need to start thinking about greenhouse gas emissions in the supply chain. We need to start thinking about potentially um, modern slavery. We need to think about whether or not any of those minerals have come from anywhere where there's conflict. Or maybe if any of those minerals have been mined by artisanal miners rather than mining corporations. All these different pieces we need to be thinking about. It's not just a new device that we've got we're going to throw away after four years. It's a device that has an impact right across its supply chain. Yeah, and we've got a follow-up question to that actually, which is Based on your experience, do university leaders understand the issues with IT supply chains or is there a knowledge gap? I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm not in the education sector, but I would say in, in my customer space, in the verticals of um, insurance and financial services, I think leaders there, they understand the complexity of the supply chain and the fragility and the impact that various things, whether it be COVID or, or war or whatever it has on the supply chain, what it means for them. But from a sustainability angle, absolutely not. There's huge gaps. People don't really understand the cost of these lovely, shiny, new you know, think pads and MacBooks. Um, it, it never comes up. They're not, they're not conscious at all, I don't think, but in the main. I think to add to that as well, and it's not just university leaders calling them out. <laughs> I think I'm fortunate for that. I think it's all of us. I think it's, you know, Ben really has highlighted it here. And I, I, of course, we're all aware of it, but I am highlighting, I'm looking at all the devices I've got in front of me, which is a scary amount, to be honest. And I, yeah, I'm okay with that. But then I start thinking, should I have these many devices? Should I start thinking about the way that I work as an individual? let alone if I would be like a university leader or, or looking after a whole group of people that maybe need to think differently. Fantastic. And um, I think we'll move on to the next part of the presentation now. And then if you have any other questions, don't worry, there's another Q&A section at the end. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Julia. So now we've been through what the challenges are, and I know that this can be quite a daunting or harrowing thing to look at. There is a solution. And, and in fact, when it comes to solving this, hopefully, you, you started to sort of understand where where the solution could potentially be. Um, and it's one of those few solutions where, as well as saving on your CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, it actually can be very cost efficient. So the solution here, two parts. One, take Windows or Mac OS potentially off the endpoint. OK, so a lot of the time, whenever we're talking or thinking about new devices, we're thinking about devices that are running Windows potentially, and we're doing all of that execution locally on that endpoint device. And what that means is, if we can go to the next slide, what that means is potentially you need to upgrade the operating system on that endpoint because maybe uh, Windows can't keep up with a lot of the demands that you've got going on. Uh, potentially you need to do more and more. Or potentially like with Windows 11, it invalidates some of the older hardware that you've got. So the solution here, take Windows off the endpoint and use your devices for longer. That is the, the, one of the key messages here. And if we think about the fact that 83% of a device's total carbon emissions, total environmental impact actually comes from manufacturing. If you can hold off on manufacturing devices or buying new devices for maybe six years rather than four. And the reason I'm saying four years here is because in my research, the average refresh cycle on a device across industries, across verticals is roughly 3.8 years. If you can hold off the six years or eight years or even up to 12 years, so three refresh cycles, you're avoiding the emissions that go with that manufacturing. And it should be pretty self-evident as well when it comes to um, the cost implications with this. So, I mean, I mean, obviously, you can probably see that. I've got a little iGel logo here surrounded in green. From, from my perspective, potentially, this is about being able to take Windows off the endpoint, put something else on there, in this case, potentially iGel, to be able to use that device for a lot longer than you would with Windows on it. So that's the solution. Use your devices for longer than you usually would. Get past that four-year refresh cycle. So, I think this is... Go on. Go on, Danny. Right, yeah. So one of the ways that we can do that um, is to shift that emphasis on having the workload on the end device, I mean, whether it's a laptop, 
whether it's a physical workstation, uh, lab, PC. We see a lot in university, you know, shared labs, shared learning centers with very expensive, very high power uh, workstations. If we can take that workload and put it somewhere else, somewhere better, that gives us a number of benefits. What it means is that we can reduce the consumption of those endpoints very, very significantly by removing a workload to a much more efficient um, point of execution. Reduce emissions from travel because once we decouple the point of execution, so the, the, the place at which our applications are delivered, if they're no longer on the device that's in the students or the lecturers or the you know um, HR facilities, finance department, if it's not physically on that device and we put it somewhere else, that decouples that user from having to go to that device to work. And they can work from anywhere on any device, any form factor, any um, type of location or network or country for that matter, and give them flexibility and freedom to work or study from anywhere, reduce the travel, reduce the impact of that device because we're no longer have we're not longer tied into a regular refresh because we, we need that M2 MacBook to run the latest processors. We don't need the latest i7 or i9, whatever it is now, mm. uh, on the endpoints and reduce the impact of the data center as well by leveraging the efficiencies of scale, leveraging the, leveraging the efficiencies of cloud, the hyperscalers. I think, Ben, you, you, you know more about this in terms of you talk about how how the power consumption is much less important than it ever was before, and how was it 2025, 2026? We talk so, about the, the yeah, cloud providers. That's right. So, so that's a that's a really interesting point. Actually, it's one of the the questions I tend to get a lot. So, if we we think about shifting that workload to a data center, the question is generally, well, aren't we just shifting the problem? Isn't isn't our greenhouse gas emissions simply being shifted to someone else to take care of? The interesting thing is across the world, and the UK actually leads the um, leads the way on this. Um, we're decarbonizing our power grids. So in the UK, back in 2009, if I was running my, my device in 2009, just consuming power, every kilowatt hour of power that I consumed would have been responsible for 607 grams of CO2. If you fast forward to the same month this year, then you're looking at 148 grams of CO2. That's a 75% reduction in CO2 emissions for every kilowatt hour that's consumed. If you have a look at Azure or AWS, they, they are planning to be completely carbon neutral in their power generation or the power consumption, sorry, by 2025. And the UK as a whole should be completely carbon neutral in, its, in, in the, the grid um, by 2035. So the power consumption piece, no matter where you put it, as long as it's in the UK or potentially around Europe, the power consumption piece is going to um, add pretty much zero to greenhouse gas emissions. So it does all then come down to the endpoint device. Even then, even, yeah, absolutely right. The, the clouds, the, the, the optimal point of execution for a lot of those workloads, but even a physical data center typically, because of the efficiencies of scale, will be a better approach than having high powered endpoints consumed you know, out, out in the field. The, the volume, the more computational workload you can put into the more efficient locations and the better. What we get though, is once we've done that, is a bunch of other benefits. And Kat, this is where you can really talk, talk about your experiences with your customers, I think. Yeah, no, not a problem. I think the thing to really highlight there, is, as Danny was saying, was about, you know, if we're going to be able to take, you know, um, I relatively make it to like, maybe like a, a gaming lab or whether it be, um, an, basically like an IT based lab. Um, I got some wonderful tours of some of our universities around the country, specifically last year, you know, when we were allowed to go back out and about again. Um, and it was really nice to see some of these labs, but I was amazed by the amount of endpoint machines that are out there. We're talking static gaming machines in some instances, and I think all of you know how expensive they are, um, to even down to, you know, wet lab, science labs. So you've got specific equipment and things in there. And I appreciate you're not going to be able to put specific beakers, weight bay things and all different types of e electronic equipment into a cloud base or into a data center. But the things where we can virtualize, consolidate and shift things, you know, like those gaming machines, for example, that is a first step in terms of making accessibility, you know, easier. And then how we're able to then start empowering people with you know, the device choice that we set, show on the screen here. I think. The thing I really want to highlight on, obviously I know we can read through all the parts that we've got here, is the flexible learning facilities, because that wasn't something that I initially had seen to be possible. Um, and two of the most recent universities I went through were going through um, a strategy of changing the way that they 
taught, um, how they had learning spaces, how they gave their facilities. They had made some changes in terms of, you know, really quite snazzy things. If you could have a vending machine for Chromebooks, for example, rather than everyone having a laptop or a PC in every room. And they're going, OK, if we're going to change the space that everyone can learn from, you don't have to define what that space is. So it doesn't have to be a maths classroom, for example, or, you know, a science classroom or a journalistic classroom. It could be a shared space that a tutor could go in there. Each person could maybe either they're hiring a laptop or they're able to pick up something from there, but the facilities are going to be the same. So you're then able to then congregate and aggregate the amount of services that you've got and rooms that you've got. Now, I'm not saying consolidate all of your, you know, your campus down into just a few rooms, but being able to be flexible with the spaces that they've got. And I appreciate some of it's happening now, but it's about consolidating that learning and, and then the devices that everyone's using, meaning that those spaces can develop and change. They can be, you know, you can have different learning things within there. You could have these fantastic walls of digital displays of things, or just down to the fact that you'll be a shared device that different people can pick up, put down, and it's secure and easy for people to use. Those are simple, to small steps that people can take within there. I appreciate building a brand new building with big shared spaces is quite a big one to undertake, but the small steps that we can do will benefit absolutely everybody. I think the, the last point I wanted to look at on here, obviously we know about travel, and I think everyone has appreciated that the abilities of remote working since we've had to over the last couple of years. But the simplifying onboarding, I think, relates to everybody, whether that be campus staff, whether that be us in a business sense, whether that be students, the ability that you don't have to go, oh gosh, where is my applications? Well, what, how do I log into this session? Well, how do I log into that classroom? Being able to have things removed from the endpoint of going, well, you have to go to room 3B and you have to access this and you have to do that. Having the ability to go, hey, you can get that from your phone or, hey, we can give you access to that. And you just have to log in using these credentials with this security pass. And you can do it from your device that you feel comfortable with. And then that broadens out the ability for everybody to learn, regardless of your location, your ability. You know, we start going to digital poverty and things like that. It covers all of those things and unifies everybody. So I don't want to take up everybody's time, but I think there's a whole host of benefits that we can really get um, from small steps in terms of, you know, looking at being more sustainable. I'll pass back to you, Danny. Please back to Ben. Oh, oh that round again. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So this is just an illustration of the amount of carbon savings that we could potentially be talking about when it comes to using a device for longer. So as I said earlier, if you were to use a device for maybe twice as long, so eight years rather than four, then potentially the total savings over that eight year period could be in a region of 350 kilos per device. So 353 kilos per device. All this depends on, on devices. It depends how it's being used, etc. But because most of the upfront greenhouse gas emissions are generally generated during manufacturing simply by using a device for longer, you have a huge saving there. And just to sort of follow on from what Kat said, so we had, a, had quite a lot of conversations with different uh, higher education institutes. And as I said earlier, I think we do have a bit of an addiction to new devices or supplying new devices. And one of the the um, sort of objections I tend to get is along the lines of, look, we're trying to recruit new students. We're trying to get students into the university. We like to give them something shiny and flashy. And this isn't just students and faculty and, and staff members of universities. It's the same across pretty much every vertical that I speak to, every industry that I speak to. One of the things that seems to resonate quite well in higher education is when maybe you, I mean, this is, this is my device, okay? This is a MacBook Air. It's about 12 years old. All right, but I'm still using it uh, and I'm using it daily because even though it's battered and even though it, it's um, got some scratches on it, it still works. I can still use this thing. So one of the things that we've had quite a few conversations about is when when um, students are, are looking at the university, when they're looking at the higher education um, uh, institution, then given the ability to be able to choose an older device, potentially, maybe one that is a, a, a bit maybe bruised, maybe scratched, etc. But if you can say to them, maybe give them um, a piece of paper, recycled, obviously, that just says something along the lines of, look, if you can love this device for another three or four years, actually, you're helping to save 353 kilos of CO2, which could be equivalent to several acres of trees. That's the sort of message that we are seeing resonating when it comes to the, the sort of demographics that we're talking to, when we're talking to, to students, when we're talking to younger people. They... They're not so obsessed with new and shiny devices. They are happy to use something that maybe has been on a journey that is experienced as long as it's got a, a good outcome or at least a good message that goes along with it. A lot of this does come down to messaging. OK, so that's the, the, the piece that I wanted to uh, sort of talk about here. Now I think it's back to Danny. Yeah, just just um, a short story, just literally about uh, Citrix. So for those of you who don't know, we've talked about Citrix a bit. So we're 
you've not heard of us, you know, soft, Citrix is a software vendor. We provide a range of technologies, principally around sort of secure remote access in a number of different approaches. And there's, you know, typically, you know, a lot of people know us as the kind of the VDI company, but that, that's really kind of a, a sort of legacy view. So number of approaches, ways in which we can ensure that people can do what they need to do to get their jobs done, get their learning done from anywhere on any device securely with good experience. But what we did um, in 2020, our ELT set a target in, in the UK, uh, UK and Nordics, I think this was, joint initiative, to convert 65,000 users to a more sustainable way of working. Through a number of initiatives and work groups and um, joint initiatives across multiple um, teams in, in our organizations and our customers, we actually smashed that target and went for 170,000 users that were moved from a sort of legacy device-based approach to a much more efficient kind of virtualized approach. Um, that alone, that initiative alone, um, accounted for 120,000 tonnes of CO2, which was equivalent to 583 square kilometres of mature forest. So it's not quite Canada and Greenland, but it is a, certainly for a, for a single year initiative, uh, for a single team, pretty um, respectable outcome, certainly smashed smashed our own internal targets. And I think that, that initiative has continued, except I don't I don't have the latest figures on that. That was our 2020 figures. Um, but I think, you know, fairly, fairly quite rightly proud of that, the people, the people that are involved. And um, I don't know how, we, how we're doing for time, but one, one of the things we, we touched on at the beginning, Dan, Dan mentioned it, that just to make everyone aware that this approach traditionally has a, has, a, has a reputation for being expensive. You know, Citrix is expensive is, is something we, we hear quite often, but what we just want to just sow a seed on today, not going into too much detail because it's a very, very complex area, but this idea of using these approaches that we've covered today, not only can we improve the sustainability position of these delivery of applications to desktops to students, but we can reduce cost. We can reduce the cost of purchasing, replacing, procuring, supporting devices. We can reduce the cost of um, power through heating, cooling, powering of the actual devices themselves. Take advantage of massive efficiencies of both physical data center and uh, hyperscaler data center efficiencies and agencies, including things like you know, BCP and DR, the ability to move workloads around intelligently. I mean, we've now got some very cool intelligence and um, tooling to in, to automatically move workloads around based on certain factors. One of those factors is cost. There is a, a, an, an initiative internally to actually be able to calculate the efficiency of different data centers, different cloud providers and move workloads based on um, that as a, as a metric. For customers, the ability to really intelligently think about how land and facilities and buildings and workspaces are used by just that decoupling of the of where applications and desktops sit letting people work from anywhere work in any room on any device on any any form factor and as kat said things like you know labs do you really need very expensive workstations sat in a lab that might be used you know an hour or five hours or ten hours a week if we can centralize those workloads and take advantage of the elasticity and the flexibility of centralized computing, then it can have a um, very, very big impact on our cost modeling. And that's certainly something that we, we'd be happy to support you in calculation. After I do an awful lot of work for our customers around the cost of cloud computing and the cost of you know, putting workloads and applications in cloud versus data center versus um, endpoints. So very happy to support you in that if that would be of interest. And it's finally me. So thank you. Thank you. That this is you're almost at the end now. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Danny, Kat and Ben for that. I'd just like to give you a brief introduction to Workspace IT and our sustainability calculator. Now, I know as some of you know who we are, some possibly some or probably some of you don't. So Workspace IT is an IT services company and we focus on end user computing. So everything we've talked about so far, the endpoint, how users get their operating systems and their applications, how they're delivered, maintained, that's what we focus on. And I hope the main thing that you've picked up from this, this whole um, presentation is that just because a device is a bit old and not capable of running Windows 11, for example, certainly doesn't mean it should be destined for, for landfill. And this is 
potentially a rare opportunity to have a positive impact on the environment and maybe save a bit of money. So Workspace IT have done a lot of work around sustainability in IT, and we've produced a very simple online calculator that gives you a very high level idea of what you could potentially save. Now, as Danny just actually said on his last slide, it's, it's quite a complex um, argument, and you, we need a lot more information about specific use cases to give an accurate answer. This calculator gives you a very high level idea of if you just repurposed all of your existing devices with iGel, what you could potentially save. Uh, it doesn't factor into the cost in the cost of potentially introducing Citrix or any other solution, but just a real high level answer. If you're interested in this, you can go to our website, which is www.workspace-it.com. And there's a link to the calculator on the front page. You just have to put in two simple numbers, the number of users in your organization, the number of devices, and it will give you a rough idea. We'd love to talk to you a bit more about your specifics and how you know, the potential whole impact of this, this uh, kind of implementation would affect your environment. So if you just put in your email address at the bottom, you'll get emailed your results and then someone will, will get back to you to talk to you about it. And just the last thing I'd like to say is that for everyone who goes to the calculator, fills in their details with their email address, we will plant a tree in the National Forest to help do our little bit for the planet. That's it. Thank you very much. And I think it's back to Julia now for the last Q&A. Yes. Hi, everyone. So uh, thank you so much for that, Dan. Um, I definitely I definitely would like a tree plant. <laughs> um, Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some great questions, actually. Um, so one of them is um, the concept of asking students to use repurposed devices is fine. But how do you suggest we offset the practical issue that well off students will buy their own devices, leaving the disadvantage to use the thin clients and generating a stigma? So that's uh, that, that's that's quite a good one. And it's a question I've had um, quite a few times from a number yeah. of different um, uh, institutions. So one of the things that we're seeing right now, and, and, and I appreciate Kat and Danny, my different answer to me, that's fine, that's allowed. Uh, one of the, the things that we're seeing right now is social change. We're seeing a lot of social change when it comes to thinking about climate change. And I use a, a couple of different examples here. One is, so I'm not a smoker, okay? So I don't want to offend anyone, anyone who's a smoker. 50 years ago, smoking was not only socially acceptable, it was encouraged. It was something you had to do to be socially accepted to a certain extent. Uh, and I'll say 50 years ago, possibly even more recent than that. At the moment, we're undergoing social change when it comes to, for instance, eating meat. So now a lot of people will try to reduce the amount of meat that they consume because that has an impact. It has an environmental impact. So previously, where, I mean, my, my, my own sort of um, experience here is I have a, a friend who likes to barbecue. And now I find myself sort of looking around whenever I'm at his house just to make sure I'm not being judged by the size of the steak that I'm eating. OK, and that's because we're, we're undergoing social change where things that used to be not only acceptable, but encouraged are becoming less and less acceptable. We're seeing that now. I am seeing this right now across across not just the market, but across across the world when it comes to new devices. I mean, if you think about mobile phones as an example, so many people I've spoken to over the past two years and especially over the past 12 months have said they are not going to upgrade their phone where previously they've done it every year, every two years. So many people, 90% of the people I speak to are now saying they're going to keep their phone for five years. And one of the main reasons is because they know how unsustainable it can be to manufacture these devices so often. So I think that stigma that you're talking about in that question, I think that's reversing. I think the stigma is going to start being attached to buying new devices where there really isn't a need to do that. And in fact, the, social, the, the socially acceptable way of using technology, of using IT is going to be to use devices for longer. And I'm actively seeing that right now hopefully that answers your question that's great yeah and there's actually a, um, a question on the same sort of similar sort of vein um which is about demographic and socio-economic factors in higher education um so susie asks are there stats to show which areas need initiatives and which areas are doing well who can be role models for other universities that sounds like cat to me well i know it more from a I don't have it from a stat point of view, and that's something I can ask of, of you guys if you if you have any stats on that from the universities that I've I've visited, and obviously the the I suppose the others like you that I've spoken to about this. I think is to add into to Ben's point as well is you know talking about the the stigma and where there are universities that may have a different variation of the type of demographic of students that come in. It's about making the baseline of the student experience. 
the same. It's about unifying that. So there's not going to be the case of, hey, someone might go and buy themselves a new fancy iPad, but at least the person who can't afford themselves has got an experience, which is one, they have the access for everything that they have. It might not be a nice shiny Chrome, whatever it is, but they have access for everything that they need to be able to do. The experience is unified because it will all be virtual to that extent. And does it help them and enable them to be able to do their work at the same level as that person? Yes, 100%. So it's about unifying that experience across the board, regardless of the device that you're using, because that becomes by the way of what that actually is, is are those things available to me to actually do the course that I need to do to achieve the things I need to do to get to where I am? And I think that's the most message that I'm hearing back from the higher education um, parties that I'm working with is essentially that, is going, how can we unify that experience so nobody's left behind? Nobody is going, okay, well, I'm paying for this, but I can't get this thing done because of X, Y, and Z. And yeah, okay, there are gonna be the factors up higher of people who've got these newfangled things, but the key part is, is regardless of how shiny or new it is, it won't give them anything more than everybody else at that baseline. And that, that's the part in there. Apologies, I don't have any stats in terms of doing that. I have visited a fair amount of universities that really vary in the type of demographics that they use. It can be anything from, you know, we're talking, you know, Russell Group higher, but London universities obviously have worked a lot. And one of our case studies is Cambridge University. However, I've worked with a lot of the ones that have come up from being polytechnics or now grouped together to be larger universities that cover, you know, let's just say larger areas in the West of the country, let's say. But a lot of those ones I've worked with, which have very varying demographics that come into them. And those questions come up more often. So it was about unifying that baseline so everybody can work in the same level was really key. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and this, I think this may be this may be one for Dan. Um, the idea of reducing the impact of the endpoint by extending the life of the device is great, but if the workload is being moved from the device to somewhere else, what is the impact of running that workload? I think actually possibly there's a Danny. Oh, a Danny, I think Danny's Danny covered one? this a little yeah. bit. Yeah, go on, Danny. I know that I know this is one of your areas, so go for it. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think I think, I think we touched on that a little bit already. Yeah. But this idea that by centralizing as much of the workload as we possibly can, we are making the most efficient use of the resources required to provide that service. So you know, it's it's this idea of being as efficient and as flexible and as agile as we can be. So it opens up lots of conversations, but combining maybe physical data centers with cloud, being really intelligent and uh, efficient and agile and flexible around how we deliver against those those needs. So again, for my customers, we, we talk about you know, the ability to grow and constrict resource capabilities. So for example, I mean, I guess a university differs from uh, a bank in that you have very define peak workloads in terms of terms or semesters or whatever you have, you have exam periods so having a flexible compute platform is very efficient versus having to provide the minimum level required hardware to satisfy the peak in demand all the time so I'll probably haven't explained that very well but you know you're 10,000 students you don't need 10,000 students worth of compute running 24 7 365 so you can be very efficient by just consolidating that demand and, sat and addressing it with combined resources from whether it's a physical data center and or cloud. So we can do some really clever stuff to make it just as efficient and as, as low impact as we possibly can. Um, and I'm not saying we move, you know, I'm not saying everything can be virtualized. There are absolutely you people and users and apps that can only be delivered by a physical device. There's no, there's no question about that. But if we're just intelligent and smart around what we deliver and where and how, um, we really can make it engaging and easy to use. And you know, as um, as Kat said, a student with a 199 quid Chromebook from Argos is not disadvantaged versus someone with a 1500 quid iPad or a laptop or a physical PC or a desktop. Um, the application delivery, the desktop delivery, the performance and the compute available to them on that end device can be yeah, equivalent at all times. Thank you. So that so the solutions I've proposed, proposed there, I think they can really help streamline the user experience for the staff and students, is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many factors to this. I mean, this is what Citric, we've built, we've built a 30-year business, $16 billion business around this idea of 
optimizing delivery of applications and desktop. And that's that's basically what our business is about. And there's lots of different ways of doing it, lots of techniques and approaches. But um, from a from an end user perspective, the ability to take a brand new device out of the box, log in with a username and password, and maybe a second factor authentication, and just be presented instantly with all the applications that you need to get your job done or get your learning done or, or whatever it is that you want to do. And some of those apps might be delivered through a web browser to your device. Some of them might be virtualized in the data center. Some of them might be in cloud. But you as a user shouldn't care. You want to know that they're secure, they're up to date, they're patched, they're the latest version, they're is it MATLAB or SPSS or whatever it is that you need. And you haven't had to go out and buy a two and a half grand laptops to, to get it. I think that's, if we were to summarize it. And then what we're doing is making sure that we deliver that in the best possible way, the most secure way, the most efficient way, the lowest cost way. Um, I think it, it combines these approaches and a byproduct of that is that we really do have the most sustainable, the lowest impact and methodologies. Fantastic. Um, I'd encourage people to get their questions in because we do still have a few minutes for questions. Oh, here we go. We have another question. Um, how do you ensure the, the student experience is delivered if they have limited access to broadband or Wi-Fi? Also, would some elements of the kit affect the experience, for example, screen size? Good question. I mean, yes, we are. When we when we do virtualize an application, we separate that to say point of execution from the point of consumption. We are dependent on a on a link between the two on the networking. Um, so it, it's it's absolutely a factor. What I would say is that you know our technology. One of the things that we we one part of our stack is something called um, HDX or high definition experience. Our networking technology is the best you can get at dealing with low or changing or poor or low bandwidth or changing bandwidth or uh, high latency connections. You know, there isn't a protocol out there that will do a better job of that. Um, but you're right, we are dependent on it. And yes, screen size is a factor. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't do my job on a five inch screen all day long. Um, but I think with it, if you're within the constraints of what the application needs, then you know, we will do the best job we can in terms of making that yeah as usable as possible um but yeah it's, it's a, yeah it is a factor we, can, we can't break the laws of physics um we do need to fit certain things into a certain screen and we do need to transmit a certain amount of data across across the network link but certainly with a, with a virtualized approach using this kind of screen scraping technology for want of a better term will we'll give you a better experience for that same user that's otherwise if we're on the assumption that they're remote if it weren't for virtualization and they're having to download applications, they'd be in a much worse position um, to the, the amount of data they need to transmit and the security of that data and the integrity of that data would be would be much lower, I believe. Fantastic. Thank you. And just remind everyone there are there is a bit more time for questions. So I'll give you a few minutes to decide if you want to ask more questions. It's not, not every day you get to ask such a panel of experts. So <laughs> I would definitely encourage it. Um, I think that I would also quite like to know. Um, so, where? Well, sorry. Um, considering the title of this webinar is um, "Building Student Attainment and Engagement," how do you encourage engagement from students to uh, for this for these platforms? Cap, do you have? You may have. <laughs> Everyone went. Hmm, it was a really good question. <laughs> because it's quite broad how we can take it. And I think yeah. addressing the other element of higher education. Now I, I covered all of public sector um, working in it. So we had a lot of challenges yeah. from you know things like NHS, which you know you can see all those things, but there's a really unique factor to um, higher education is the attraction and retention of students. You know, when when you've got patients, they're there, whether you want them or not, you you've got them. But it's how do you attract them to here and how do you get them engaged with that? And as you said, uh, as I said in one of the earlier slides in there, you know, previously it would be, where's your campus? How exciting is your city? What's all that sort of stuff? That's still relevant, but I think now is, how can you help me be part of your university? Now, if it's the case of whether I have um, learning difficulties or if I'm in a completely remote location or if I have specific requirements or I would love this from my university, the flexibility of being able to do maybe partial remote learning or how do you do things with overseas students I think that's an element of where there's people getting engaged now I'm never going to say hey everyone needs to take an open university model because that's not the case but a flexible sort of element of things of going how do I attract 
new students and different types of students, whether it be you're trying to do new courses or adapt to the way that you're going to present yourself out there. I think that's a really interesting thing of how you present it. It's just not how snazzy and bright your building is now or what your city is like. It's what do I offer and how easy is it for me to be part of your university? That, that's how I've seen it, along with you know lots of different types of courses and things. But from yeah. a sustainability and IT point of view, it's not just, oh, they have shiny new Chromebooks or oh, they have a really fancy digital wall that shows a waterfall or whatever. It could be, how can I access this so I don't have to travel four days of the week? Can I do it where I go to a lecture twice a week and then I can access everything else from home and I'm not behind? You know, it's that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I think this next question we have is quite um, is somewhat related, actually, which is how hard is it to get people to buy into the eco view, especially if students are undecided on their place of study. Some people will be looking for kit as part of their decisions. Visitors to the site, etc., may not be aware of what you're trying to achieve and just think you're under investing. I think so. That, that's a that's a really good question. Again, they're all good questions, obviously. Um, and I think it goes back to when we're talking about visibility and what different generations are actually concerned about. And actually, climate change is one of those things that goes above and beyond the, the usual conversations that we've been having. I mean, I've been in, in the technology industry for a long time now. And most of the conversations I've been having previous to the past sort of two years have been very much technology led conversations with um, IT managers, IT teams, etc. Now, though, because of the rise in visibility of sustainability of climate change, a lot of the conversations I'm having are with heads of sustainability, with, are with other stakeholders, because everybody is buying into this. I mean, as an example, when I um, when I told my wife that I think sustainability is a, is a really, really good thing to focus on in technology, she said, yeah, absolutely. And she's the one that put me onto TikTok and said, everybody on TikTok is talking about sustainability. This isn't something that just impacts certain segments of uh, an organization. Everyone, everybody in the world is a stakeholder when it comes to climate change, when it comes to the climate emergency. So people are bought in to this, 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 this eco view, as it says in the question, people are bought into this. Um, and I think when you have a look at, at research, so some research that, that we found, I think this came from NUA, that 54% of students when they're when they're looking uh, trying to decide in the next university do actually have a look at the green agenda and make the decision based on the, the green agenda as one of the the aspects of their decisions this absolutely does tie into attracting students um, to come and study at your institution because they are much more concerned than people of my generation were at their stage in life they are much more bought into this message and I think it can be difficult to to sort of get that or understand that if you're not part of their their generation but this is huge for them hopefully that answers the question definitely i just um, just quickly so the, this is the question we're talking about you know visitors to site may not be aware i think the what, what we're talking about potentially is was there's lots of approaches lots of combinations we're not saying a one size fits all for everything but potentially within a within a campus environment within a student learning environment the devices that are on the desk, the screens, the keyboards, the mouse, there's no reason for those to change necessarily. It just don't need to be replaced because the computer has moved somewhere else. So when they're coming in and sitting down and working, the applications, the desktops that they're consuming should be kind of state of the art. So the fact that we repurposed or reprovisioned a device at the end point doesn't, shouldn't impact the user experience of, of using that device. And couple that with there's another question here just about um uh, was it the extended device you're saying to switch the os to igel yes potentially on those fixed devices those devices that are in a lab in a learning center in a library yes convert that to igel reprovision it reduce the computer the, the, the consumption of that device and the need to update it regularly great but then you said you know uh, ask about other applications may wish to run outside of he work or a learning curve for a new OS. So there's no learning curve for a new OS. iGel isn't a new OS from the end user's perspective. They will be consuming a Windows desktop or Windows application, potentially, or Linux, whatever it is that, we, that, is, that is delivered to them. So there's no learning, there's no difference for the end user, per se. But also, because we have the ability to publish and virtualize individual applications, we can deliver SaaS and web applications, if a user is using their own endpoint, we're not talking, we're not necessarily talking about students converting their devices to iGel necessarily. So we do have a solution for that, Danny. Okay, I'll, I can see you're itching to talk. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah I'm just typing away as well. I'll let Ben do it. Go on. I, think we're, I think we're out of time. So, <laughs> okay. Um, no, we could, you could. If any please carry on. Windows, they can still consume up to date applications. But, Ben, just very quickly, do you want to? 
No, no, sorry, Danny. No, it's a really, really good point. So uh, potentially when we're talking about those devices which aren't university owned or institution owned, it could be BYO, then we do have a way of doing that too. And that's, and I, I don't want to turn this into a picture, but very quick, quickly, we have this whole concept around a UD pocket that you can just plug in to that device, boot it up, and then you're in your, potentially in your university or higher education uh, workspace. So once you want to, well, once you're, you're doing all your HE work, you can work on that. When you finish with that, you can simply unplug it and then you can go back to whatever the operating system is on that laptop potentially. So that's how you can have that sort of dichotomy. You can have the, the higher education applications. You can use that device for longer. If the, if the student, if the stakeholder, whoever they are, want to be able to access applications which are outside of HE, they've got their own operating system there that they can use as well. So that's incredibly flexible to be able to do that. And obviously Citrix comes in and sits really nicely with both of those different models. Fantastic. Thank you. So yeah, unfortunately, that does bring us to the end of our discussion. So I'd like to thank everyone for taking part today and to remind the audience that there will be an on demand recording of the discussion and a summary article published on Times Higher Education in due course. It will also be sent to you, I believe. Um, we hope that you found today useful and we hope to be able to engage with you at future THE events. So thank you so much and goodbye.